Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Olive Lutheran Church and uh, those viewing online. For those of you who do not know, my name is Nick Cushman. I'm the pastor here at Mount Olive, and it's good for us to be here on this 24th Sunday after Pentecost. And, uh, and as we've been doing uh, lately with these live streams, uh, because not everybody sticks around to the end, we do some of our announcements uh, at the beginning. Uh, you may have uh, seen if you got the weekly update email yesterday. Uh, last week we had our congregational voters meeting, um, and then we extended the uh, time that we could receive ballots through last Thursday. And Friday we counted up the votes. Uh, there were 40, if I remember correctly, 43 uh, total votes cast. So uh, thank you for everybody who... Uh, helped out with that and the budget passed and everybody who was on the ballot uh, passed as well and if you have any questions about that or would like a specific vote count uh, we're more than happy to give it to you you can just contact me uh, in the office uh, next another thing from that email uh, you may have uh, seen that on Friday th there was uh, a freeze that was announced uh, by the governor uh, and one of those one of the parts about the new regulations was lowering the number of people allowed in worship from 50 uh, to 25. Uh, the Board of Elders is aware of that, and we're talking about how we want to approach uh, that moving forward, and we will keep you updated. So again, uh, if you aren't receiving the emails, uh, check your spam folder if they're going there. Uh, let the church know what your email address is, or uh, you can go to our website, and there's a link that you can sign up for the email list there. Uh, two other quick updates uh, that I announced during the congregational meeting. Uh, upcoming services, we have our Thanksgiving Eve service, which is the 25th, right? The Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll be having our normal Thanksgiving Eve service here. Uh, those services are typically uh, under 25 people. We will be live streaming that service, uh, as well as our uh, uh, midweek Advent services. We will be doing that, and we will be live streaming it. Uh, which will be great for some of you who typically haven't been able to uh, come to those because you're not comfortable driving at night. Now you can get online and, uh, and worship along with us. And then finally, uh, the Board of Elders and I are talking about uh, doing a, uh, a video service for Christmas Eve this year. Uh, the reason for that being not knowing how many people will feel comfortable coming, how many guests there will be, you know, how, how do we schedule the services, do we add services, how, and just trying to juggle all of those things, we thought, what if we, instead of trying to you know, juggle all of those things, we focus our energy into uh, making a very special uh, video service. We're hoping to have some stuff from the children's ministry and possibly even the preschool involved uh, in that. And uh, so that will be available online on Christmas Eve. And then the people who receive DVDs of the service, you'll have that. Uh, to be able to watch on Christmas Eve also. And then Christmas Day, we will have our Christmas Day service uh, at 10 o'clock uh, for those of you who feel as if you missed out on being in person on Christmas Eve. Uh, one final thing for those uh, viewing online, if you haven't seen the comment in the, in the the right under the live stream, you can go to the website to download a copy of the bulletin. Uh, it's under the video tab. Uh, yeah, that all being said, I invite you to stand as we begin with our opening hymn, hymn 904, Blessed Jesus at your table. Thank you.
make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, or forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of praise.
Almighty and ever-living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Dispel from us the works of darkness and grant us to live in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, that our faith may never be found wanting. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the prophet Zephaniah, the first chapter. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of Mordor, for all the traders are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, and sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Alleluia verse. St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. For one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. 
And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we continue with our sermon hymn in 783, Take My Life and Let It Be. my mouth and meditation of our hearts. Be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our living and loving Redeemer. Amen. Every year at Christmas time, my parents 
give, or I, I guess in the language of our parable today, my parents entrust $50 to each person in our family. They also send us a copy of the, the World Vision catalog. And you see that that $50 isn't for us to keep and have for ourselves. That $50 is for us to use, for us to put to work. And so we get to page through the catalog and, and we can decide, you know, if we want to buy school supplies for, for some children who are in need, or maybe some sports equipment. Maybe we can buy a duck or, or some chickens, or sometimes we, a few people pull their money together and we buy a goat. Or you can buy Bibles for, for these children who are in need. And it's become a fun family tradition. It's something we look forward to each year. We might even say, oh, I kind of want to do this, but I'm going to do this instead. Maybe next year I'll, I'll, I'll do this one. And so I'm looking forward to doing that again this year. But I wonder what it would be like if instead of... You know, my, my parents either, you know, visiting us at the time, you know, with the catalog or, and, or when they're distant, sending us a catalog and calling us and saying, hey, each of you has $50 and here is what I would like you to do with it. What if, just randomly out of the blue, a $300 check for my parents just showed up in the mail? No instructions, no expectations. What would we do with the money? I, I, I wouldn't want to mi misuse it, but I, I don't know exactly what to do with it. I would probably have a few questions. And our parable this morning, while it is a bit more straightforward than the parable we looked at last week, the, the parable of the ten virgins, this parable still raises a lot of questions. And I want to look at some of those questions with you this morning. First question is, well, what is a uh, talent? You know, we have these, these, uh, these three servants or these three slaves, and one has received five, one has received two, one has received one. What, are, what is a talent? Well, you might remember from the, the parable of the unmerciful servant uh, several weeks ago from Matthew 18 that, that had to deal with talents. Uh, it is a, a measurement or a unit of money, and one talent is worth roughly 20 years wages. And so to keep the math kind of simple, let's say a, a year's wages is $50,000 a year. If that were the case, a talent would be worth $1 million. This is not a, a small thing we're dealing with. We are talking about a large amount of money. The next question I think of when we look at this parable is, is there a difference between the first two servants? You know, we've got these three, and so you might want to look at, okay, how, what, what are each of the three servants? Well, what about the first two? Sure, they, they have received different amounts of money, one five talents, five million dollars, one two talents, you know, two million dollars. But they, they've received those different amounts according to their ability, the, the parable says. And yes, I would rather have five million than have two million if I had my choice, but I would still be incredibly happy with two million dollars. Now, both of these servants act the same way. They, they do the same thing. They, they, they both double their money. And as their master returns, they both respond to their master in virtually the exact same way. And the master's response to each of them is virtually exactly the same. So as we look at the, this parable, rather than looking at three different uh, sets of servants, it, it's probably easier to look at two different servants, to, to lump the first and the second one together and compare them with the third servant. Now, as I, again, look at those first two, I, I wonder, how did they double their money? And, and where did they get their investment advice from? I would love to have that. Now, I don't know how important it actually is that they doubled their money. Instead, I think the idea of doubling their money it really helps demonstrate the length of time that their master was away. Doubling your money isn't something that happens overnight, at least not if you're trying to double your money responsibly. But, but unlike last week's parable, where the, the bridegroom appeared suddenly and people were caught unaware, and that was the focus there, this parable seems to kind of be focusing on, instead of, are you ready, it's, what are you doing 
in the time while the master is away. You know, again, I, I, I can't even imagine what those two guys did to double their money. You know, I've, I've always said that I will never win big in Vegas. I will never win big in Vegas, not because I'm a terrible gambler. It's because I, I will never, I am too afraid to risk big. And in order to, to win big, you have to risk the same thing in the stock market. You know, there are people who like to buy individual stocks and they are going to buy highly or do all this stuff. That's not me. I would be way too afraid to risk that much in order to win or earn or receive that much. Now, speaking of being scared, I, I want to shift our, our focus to the third servant in our parable. Was he right to be afraid? He says that he's afraid. Was he right to be afraid? It, it's understandable that he would be afraid. Again, you, you receive a million dollars, and I don't know if he looked at the guy who had five and the guy who had two and was jealous. I, I don't know, but just like the, a random check arriving from my parents and me not knowing what to do with it, I can only imagine just somebody saying, here, here's a million dollars. Okay, well, I, I don't want to mess this up, right? And, and, and what, what real motivation do you have to, to put it to good use? You know, if I, it's not my money, it's still your money. So if I make money with this, do I get to receive that money or am I just making money for you? Now, what happens if I lose money? Well, then does that come out of my paycheck? Do I end up having to, so if I gain money, it's yours, but if I lose money, I have to pay for it. And so, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to play it safe. I'm going to stick to the penny slots or the, the quarter uh, video poker. I'm just going to play it safe. I'm going to bury it in the hole. I'm not going to risk anything. But why exactly was he scared? The parable actually tells us. He, he answers that question himself. He says to the master, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Now, here's another question. And this, I, I think, is perhaps the most important question and the key to understanding this parable. Was he right? Not was he right to bury the talent, but was he right in his assessment of the master? He says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Was he? It's, it's easy for us to quickly read through this parable and assume that the answer is yes. I mean, look at the master's response. You, the master's response, well, hey, uh, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gathered where I scattered no seed. Is the master affirming? the servant's assessment of, of the character of the master? Or is he just playing along? All right, for the sake of argument, let's say that I am a hard man. Well, then shouldn't you have done this? I think that's much more likely the case. I mean, first of all, look, look at the master in the parable. At the beginning of the parable, he entrusts nearly $8 million dollars to three of his servants. Does a hard man do something like that? How many billionaires do you know who just get ready to get out of town like, you know, the, the butler's answer? Hey, hey, here, I'm just going to leave for a while. Here, you take that. Here, you take that. A hard man wouldn't do something like that. On, on top of that, uh, again, we have these three servants who receive three different amounts, and we're told that they receive according to their ability. So this isn't some aloof master off in, in, in the distance who knows nothing about No, he intimately knows these servants. He knows their abilities, what, what they're capable of doing. He knows the servants. On top of that, stepping outside of the, the specifics of, of the narrative of this parable, who is the master? Jesus. Right? Jesus is, is, is the master. Does the third servant sound like he is talking about Jesus? I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. 
It doesn't sound like the Jesus I know. It doesn't sound like the Jesus in the parable of the sower who scatters seed. Every, there, there is no place where he scattered no seed. That's not the Jesus that we know. But that's the Jesus. That's the master that this third servant knew. How you view God, who you view God to be, has a huge impact on how you live your life. How many times have you heard an atheist or somebody who claims to be agnostic say, well, I could never believe in a God who, and then fill in the blank. I could never believe in a God who would send people to hell just for not believing in them. I can't believe in a God who would judge people just because how they, who they choose to love or how they choose to live their life or just because they worship in a slightly different way. I could never believe in a God who did something like that. Now these people have a wrong view of who God is and how he operates. But on top of that, let, let's kind of play out the, the, the third servant in the parable here. Let, let's play along and say, all right, if you knew me to be a God who simply sent people to hell just because they didn't believe in him or because of certain choices they made in their life or because they chose to worship in a slightly different way, if you, re, if you knew me to be a God who is like that, guess what? You can't unbelieve God away. If that is the nature of God, rather than saying, oh, I can't believe in a God who does that, it'd be like burying your talent. If, if, if God is indeed like that, shouldn't you straighten up and figure out everything you can possibly do to appease this God and to get right with this God? And you better look through those sacred texts and you better order your life exactly this way because this is an angry, vengeful God looking to smite you. Get your life right. If that was the case, that's how you should choose to live your life. But again, I, I think a lot of people, instead of thinking of God like that and acting accordingly, they think of God like that and dismiss it. And the tragedy is, if, if they did think of God like that and order their life accordingly, it actually would set them up in a great place to hear the good news of the gospel. Because as they are trying to do everything they can to, to appease this vision they have of this angry, vengeful God, the soil would be right for them to hear about the true love and mercy of the gracious God they serve. How we view God has a huge impact on how we live our lives. I think some people can read this parable and focus on, on those first two servants and the fact that they doubled their money and they earned enough to please their master. And when we view the parable that way, it, it can twist our thinking into a, a view of, of the law and of works righteousness. And again, trying to make sure we are ordering our lives to, okay, what are the things that God has given me and have I done enough so that when he returns, he looks at all that I have done for him and says, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not the focus of the parable. The focus of the parable is not me and what I am doing. It's how we view our master. And when we view our master as a loving and gracious and generous God, it has an impact on how we live our lives. And we go and we put what he has entrusted to us, whether it's our gifts and talents or the true treasure, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That to work in our lives, and we see the benefits of that reaping and growing. Not worry about have we done enough. I uh, have a big book on my, my shelf uh, written by one of my professors, and, and I, I, I wanted to read uh, the end of his section on this parable because I think it's beautiful. He says, the danger is not that a disciple would not try hard enough or be productive enough. 
It's that somehow the disciple would lose sight of the master's character and his own identity and not serve at all. Did you, did you get that? That, that it's not, the, the danger is not that I'm not producing enough to please God. God doesn't need my production. God can, can do it all. The danger is that I lose sight of the true God and of his nature and my identity as his servant. Then, then he gives this, this beautiful picture. Uh, uh, he, he says, we need to uh, reckon with the fact that he will reckon with us and ask us, have you lived as my slave? Have you served me? Then he says, I can imagine a conversation like this on the last day. One slave approaches the master and says, Lord, you entrusted these things to me, and I have gained this much, but there was so much more I could have done. The master replies, yes, I am well aware that there was more that you could have done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. A second slave approaches the master and says, Lord, you entrusted this to me, and I have gained an additional amount. But I was timid too often. I failed to take advantage of all of the opportunities that were presented to me. The master replies, yes, I recall every detail of all the time that you were a coward. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The same verdict and, and divine joy await every Christian, not just those who serve productively or faithfully enough. Whatever that might conceivably mean, in the end, at the end, it matters only that Christ is my master who has purchased me and I have been his slave. He entrusted me think, to me things that I was able to work with for his glory. If I keep my eye on the master, then I will remember to be his slave and to live that way. So our encouragement today is not to obsess over whether we have done enough, because that is an endless loop that will either lead us to pride or to despair. Instead of to look to the master what he has done for us, what he has given to us, and who he has made us to be. Not just his servants, but his children. And we go out free and live as though we are. Amen. And now may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our service continues as we confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 7 in your bulletin. We rise. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begot not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who was for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit under which Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for Christ under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have an end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Normally, this would be where we receive our offering. However, since our 
circumstances, we will not be passing the offering plates around. Of course, there will be offering plates available uh, at each of the exits on your way out if you uh, choose to give at, at that time. But also, again, we want to thank everybody who has continued to uh, faithfully support the ministry of Mount Olive through uh, mailing in their checks or dropping them off at the office or those who have signed up to give online. But now we come together in prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people, according to their needs. Almighty Father, as the day of the Lord draws ever nearer, when your Son will return to judge the living and the dead, we pray that you would grant your people to remain faithful to the end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, though we do not know the day or hour of your Son's appearing, grant that we would always be prepared by sending us faithful pastors and teachers who will boldly proclaim your word of law and gospel to us, that we may be constantly encouraged and built up in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us always to be good and faithful servants who are diligent stewards of all that you so graciously provide. Especially grant us to be generous in speaking of the salvation that you provide for all through your Son. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. everlasting Father, you have given us the gift of your creation. And though this world is passing away due to sin, we pray that you would preserve it for our use and provision until you usher in the new creation to come. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. merciful Lord, we pray that you would grant healing and relief to all who are afflicted in mind, body, or soul. We especially pray for Bernice, Candy, and Susan, as well as those we name now in the silence of our own hearts. Give them the peace and comfort that only comes through Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, our times are in your hand. Look with favor upon those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Jans and Jeannie. Grant that they may continue to grow in wisdom and grace. Strengthen their trust in your goodness and bless them with your abiding love all the days of their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, until your Son returns in glory, he has given us the supper of his body and blood to sustain us. Grant that all who receive this gift today may receive it in faith, trusting that it is given for them for the forgiveness of their sins and life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare for the service of the sacrament, just a quick reminder on our communion procedure. Uh, you will be ushered up uh, in groups at a time. There will be four stations here with the little uh, rings and a, a plate with the, uh, the cup and the, the host will be uh, set on each of those plates. As you wait for the previous table in front of you to leave, uh, you can then come up as, as everybody uh, is at the table. I will welcome you, saying welcome to the Lord's table. At that point, uh, you are free to take off your mask or hang it from an ear or uh, however you choose to do it. And then uh, I'll say the words of distribution. Uh, after that, and you receive the blessing, you can place your mask back on and then uh, return to uh, there will be a receptacle to receive the, the plate uh, and, and your cup. And then the next table will come up as the elders uh, replenish the supply at the tables. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Amen. Let, them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, 
evermore praising you and saying, sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated for the Agnes Day. <laughs>
We rise with the post we didn't cancel. <laughs> Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, hymn 917, Savior again, to thy dear name we raise. <laughs>
concludes our service. Again, uh, thank you for joining us both here in person as well as those uh, streaming online and for your patience as we try to figure out the best way to, to efficiently but also safely uh, do communion. Uh, just a, another quick reminder to keep an eye out uh, later this week for uh, an update about any changes we might be making uh, due to the new COVID regulations. I will uh, say goodbye here to the online uh, people. So go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.